So this is Keith. He's going to talk about Pico libc. Uh, Keith from Sci-Fi. So, go. Thank you very much. Oh. Get my hat off. I'm indoors now, right? I don't have to protect myself from the sun. Uh, as I, as he said, my name is Keith Packard. I work for Sci-Fi right now. Uh, Sci-Fi, as you may know, is a uh, Risk Five semiconductor. Uh, design house. Uh, I joined uh, in the summertime, and I've had in summertime North America in uh, Northern Hemisphere, so in July, and I've been having a great time. Um, I've been working on Pico Libc for about a year and a half now. Started out as New Lib Nano, which turned out to be a name that was in use, um, and so I uh, oh, changed the name to Pico Libc. So what is? Uh, so what? So I'm talking about embedded C libraries. Um, this is not small Linux systems. This is not, uh, this is not uh, full time. Uh, there's no operating system typically in an embedded system. On uh, embedded C library, uh, typical application, so I'm thinking thermostats, refrigerators, uh, that, that scale of system. Uh, a typical embedded C library application needs very little out of the actual library itself. It probably needs some math functions. Uh, I may do a couple of square roots, maybe a little trigonometry. Um, uh, you're going to need, uh, um, oftentimes, the uh, mathematics functions are being uh, executed on a, a processor that doesn't have a floating point system. So the math functions that you want uh, need to be kind of cognizant of what uh, soft float uh, restrictions are and the performance characteristics of those. Um, oftentimes, the only functions you end up using is uh, string functions. Uh, str copy, mem copy, mem move, and, and, and formatted printing for debugging. A uh, typical deeply embedded system doesn't even use, uh, doesn't ha have any file system, uh, so we're not doing standard I.O. file access. Uh, so very, very limited uh, use of libc. So one of the big goals of an embedded C library is to get the heck out of the way, uh, to remain small, uh, uh, tightly coded, uh, and to not have a lot of dependencies. Uh, on, a, on a small system, I'm talking really small systems, uh, you know, this scale of board, that's about a one centimeter square board uh, with just a processor chip and a couple of, uh, a couple of, um, a couple of uh, um, chips that are doing things. Um, small, uh, small memory in the modern era, embedded systems, uh, RAM is much more constrained than ROM. Um, the Sci-5 board, this is a Hi5 Rev B board. It has, you know, a few kilobytes of ROM and you know, maybe 100 or 200 kilobytes of ROM and, and very little RAM, like two or three, maybe 16 kilobytes of, ROM, of RAM. So you want systems that have a very light RAM footprint, but also that don't use ridiculous amounts of RAM. Um, in, in a lot of the embedded work that I do in space applications, so satellites and rocketry stuff, um, those are very, uh, very sensitive to uh, failure modes. Um, and so when I'm coding an application to run in a satellite, um, I don't want to use uh, dynamic memory allocation at all. Uh, I want to statically allocate every possible object I will ever use in the lifetime of the application so that I know that there's absolutely no possibility of uh, running out of heap. Uh, and so you want a, a, a C library that isn't dependent upon malloc and free. Uh, uh, malloc can obviously fail, um, and oftentimes your embedded system has no way to recover from that. Um, on a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, embedded systems on the uh, Cortex-M series from ARM, on the, the smaller uh, RISC-V uh, boards, they have 32-bit floats, but they don't have any 64-bit floats. 32-bit uh, float takes a quarter of the base of a 64-bit float, and so it's uh, critical that, you, uh, that the embedded library, uh, if it's going to do floating point at all, that it be very aware of the difference in, in cost between 32 and 64-bit floats. Uh, of course, a lot of them have none at all. Uh, okay, so uh, I've been doing embedded C, uh, C application development on 32-bit processors for about 10 years now. Um, and I do all of my stuff in uh, free software. Uh, and when I started doing embedded development, I was, uh, started working on 8-bit processors. Uh, when you get an 8-bit processor, like an 8051 or an AVR at, at Mega 328 or something, the development environments for those processors come with a C library. So SDCC comes with a C library. Uh, the AVR C compiler comes with AVR libc. Uh, so they all have a C library with them. And so when I moved to 32-bit development for ARM, it's like, well, where's my C library? I'm sitting here coding with my happy little compiler. The compiler's provided. Uh, where's stir copy? And the answer is crickets. There is no real standard C library for embedded systems in, in the 32-bit world. 
Uh, when you download the ARM compiler for 32-bit embedded work from uh, embedded development from ARM, it comes with Newlib, Newlib, which is actually work done by Cygnus back in the 80s, 90s. Uh, that was designed to make, uh, to provide POSIX-like environments on a wide variety of operating systems, including Windows and VMS and all kinds of stuff. Um, and that new lib source code base has been around uh, for longer than most of us have been programming. Uh, um, not as long as me, but... Um. <laughs> um, so Newlib and Newlib Nano are designed for a real hosted or operating system rich environment. Uh, it has a library called libgloss, that provides a POSIX API, and it expects underneath that for there to be a real operating system. Uh, so in a, in, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a FreeBSD or Linux environment, libgloss could actually implement the syscall interface. Um, I don't know if it does. I haven't looked at libgloss in a long time. Uh, in newlib and newlib nano, these are applications that are expecting to, uh, a library that's expecting to be supporting you know, real applications like a compiler, uh, um, a, a text editor, and this kind of stuff where um, I.O. operations need to be efficient and fast. Uh, so the uh, standard I.O. newlib is, is very fast, uh, but it's also resource intensive. Uh, you're running newlib on a typical, typical machine. Malloc is kind of expected. Al applications, most of the applications written on big computers use a lot of uh, dynamic, dynamic, dy dynamic memory allocation. Um, there are some proprietary options available. If you look around, if you do embedded ARM or RISC-V uh, or, or maybe even embedded power development, I don't know, um, there are uh, commercially available embedded libraries for these uh, proprietary systems that are supported. Um, they're all closed source, of course. Uh, I believe, although I don't know because I haven't ever used them, uh, I believe they probably come from the 8 and 16-bit world, uh, so kind of migrating up the, up the stack as the, as the processors get bigger. Um, so I can't fix them. I can't ship them with my GPL licensed code because they're closed source. Uh, so I can't, I can't actually use them myself. So that's what I found when I started doing development about 10 years ago. Uh, and it's like, well, what do I do? Uh, I used for a long time, um, well, I'm trying to remember the name of it. It was uh, a BSD licensed, uh, a very small libc. I used it for so long, I don't even remember the name of it. There was another one. It was terrible. I wanted to get rid of it. Um, so I decided what I really wanted to do was, was take new lib and see if I couldn't take advantage of the fact that it had a bunch of really pretty good code in it. Uh, the math routines look, looked principled. They had error bounds documenting what they did. Uh, the string routines were optimized for a bunch of different architectures. It had a, bunch of, a, lot, of bunch, a lot of good assembly code in it uh, for making some of the low-level string operations go fast. Um, it, had, uh, it offered what looked like a very, uh, very standards-compliant POSIX interface. So if you look what a POSIX libc does, newlib does a lot of that. Um, it's been used by a lot of people for a long time, so you know the kind of little corner cases have probably been ironed out. Um, and it's got all of that rich NCC uh, uh, standards goodness that I wanted from a C library. <laughs> if you're coding in a system, the last thing I really want to do is have to say, well, I know how this function is supposed to work in NCC. Let me go see if my embedded uh, closed source library does it the same way. Let me go dig through the documentation and diff the documentation against the real NCC specification and see if there are differences. I really wasn't interested in that. I would like to be able to take my C, C development knowledge honed over the last 40 years um, and bring that in, uh, into the embedded world. So one of the things that I looked at first was getting rid of this uh, a, uh, API wrapper that uh, mapped a POSIX API onto some other operating system. Because in my world, there is no operating system. I don't have a file system typically. I don't have... Uh, I don't have processes or threads, or I often don't have a real-time clock, so I have no date functionality. Um, so I, I, just got, I decided to just discard libgloss and see what happened if I got rid of that. Um, and so I, I created this thing called uh, Pico Libc. Uh, it takes mostly uh, code from Newlib. It actually lives in the same source code uh, format as Newlib uh, for reasons we'll get into later. It takes all of the math functions, the internationalization function, the string functions, uh, with all that performance and broad support and standard, uh, standards conformance. Um, but it discards that, that uh, ultra-efficient and memory-intensive standard I.O. stuff. And I actually took the standard I.O. Uh, code out of the AVR libc. Now, this is an 8-bit uh, uh, libc. Uh, the standard I.O. library from that was extremely well and tightly crafted. 
Um, and it uh, used essentially no memory. We'll go into uh, what, what that looks like in a while. But in particular, a file struct, which is kind of the primitive object that you use to do I.O. and standard I.O., takes just 20 bytes of RAM. Uh, in newlib, a uh, file struct would take about seven or eight kilobytes of RAM with buffering and all this extra data structures that it had. Um, so I'm saving an enormous amount of RAM. Now, obviously, when you get rid of buffering, uh, there are performance impacts. Uh, but in my applications, uh, that's really not a big deal. Um, now, I say it's adapted from uh, the AVR libc. It's not exactly the same, because the AVR libc had a bunch of 8-bit Atmel assembly code doing some of the low-level things, like formatting floating point numbers. Uh, so I actually had to replace that with some C code. Uh, I think I found pieces on the, on the web that was uh, appropriately licensed um, and incorporated that in and then did a bunch of other stuff on my own. Uh, here's what standard IO looks like uh, in Pico Libc. Uh, this, um, uh, this is the entire structure. There's no pointers here except to functions. Uh, it's got a couple of, it's got uh, a single character un, unget buffer, which is all that ANSI requires. Uh, so if you try to do, un, if you try to back up your input more than one character, sorry, um, applications should be certainly well crafted to avoid that. <laughs> yeah, I actually had to, for one application of this, I actually had to put another layer of unget on top of that because I needed three characters of unget. Um, some flags uh, to define the characteristics of it. Um, um, and then th basically three function pointers. And the three function pointers are put a character, get a character, and flush the output buffer. Uh, the original AVR libc didn't even have flush. It really expected that put a character to go right to some UART or something. Uh, but because I'm, I'm using oftentimes uh, uh, machines with uh, USB um, uh, interfaces, uh, I need some way to say, OK, actually signal the host uh, that you have data that's ready for transmission. Uh, so I needed a flush function. And that's basically hooked directly to F flush. So if you call F flush, you end up calling that function uh, pretty directly. Uh, so I, um, the um, Pico libc then puts underneath this, if you happen to have something which, which implements uh, a POSIX uh, syscall interface, um, there's a, a layer you can add underneath Pico libc uh, that takes advantage of read, write, uh, lseq, open, and close. Those are the only five functions that it needs. Um, did I count that right? Yeah the only five functions that it needs, and then it provides fopen, fdopen, and all those kinds of APIs on top of that. Um, and layering with using this struct, same struct file. Uh, so you can, you can get buffered I.O. underneath picolibc, but picolibc itself doesn't include uh, any file buffering. That saves a bunch of memory. Okay, print, uh, printf and scanf. The dominant use in my world of embedded programming, printf and scanf, is pretty darn simple. I use printf and scanf for debugging, uh, because in the embedded world, debugging printf is an awesome tool, uh, just like in Linux, right? I also use GDB, don't get me wrong. Uh, printf is not the only debugging tool that I use. Uh, so one of the problems that, uh, obviously, that uh, printf and scanf has is that they, in the ANSI spec, they support floating point input and output, right? You expect to be able to read and write floating point numbers with printf and scanf. But that means that if you use a version of printf and scanf that supports floating point input and output, it's going to pull in um, all of this floating point support. If you have a processor that doesn't have an FPU, you're going to suck in all the, floating, all the soft float code out of your, out of your kernel, out of your, uh, G, uh, out of your uh, libgcc. Um, so what I've done uh, is I offer int only and float only options, which are available as a compile time option for your application. The library actually expresses all three versions, and you can select on a call-by-call -call basis whether you're calling one that only handles integers, one that only handles single precision floats, or one that handles integers, single precision, and double precision floats. Um, and you just define these anywhere you like before you include standard io.h. Um, and it will, it will redefine printf as you know, underscore, underscore i, underscore printf. Uh, to say that it's an integer-only version, or underscore, underscore, f, underscore, printf, to say that it's a float-only version. Uh, and that saves an enormous amount of memory. We'll see how that works. Uh, so to use the float-only printf code, how many of you are, are all too aware of uh, C's awesome ABI uh, for floating-point numbers? Yeah, well, it, I'll, I'll explain it briefly. Uh, in the C uh, ABI, uh, because of its origins on the PDP-11, I'm pretty sure, um, 
I'm pretty sure that, that that's the reason for it. When you pass a float, which is to say a 32-bit uh, IEEE 754 number to a function, the compiler helpfully coerces that to a double 64-bit value uh, before it passes it to a, to a function like printf, which, is, uh, which takes untyped or, or var args uh, parameters. So kind of the default type for a floating point number being passed to a C function is a double in the case of printf. So if you want to pass just a float and not a double, uh, you have to do some ugly magic. And I did it with the usual uh, collection of uh, C inlines. This is not a macro, actually. Printf float does something horrible. It takes a float, sticks it in a union with a 32-bit int, and passes the 32-bit int. And when I figured that out, I was like, well, that's really awful, but that's going to save me a lot of space in my executable. OK, here we go. Yeah, OK, sometimes C is not my favorite language. I think that's most days. Yeah. OK, so that's what this does. The printf float macro, of course, if you don't define picolibc float printf scanf, the, the printf float macro just passes it as a double, because that's what it's expecting. Um, and this is actually a program you can run. This is a, a complete picolibc program. Uh, we'll show, see this running uh, in a little while. OK, so what does this do for the size of my executable? Here are the three different versions, uh, the integer-only version, uh, the version with floats, and the version uh, with floats and doubles. Now, this is on a uh, RV32 IMAC uh, processor, which is a RISC-V processor that includes integers, um, uh, multiply, atomics, and compressed instructions but it does not include floating point or double precision hardware. So this is uh, pulling in that soft float library and you can see the impact of that. Uh, so the integer only version is two kilobytes. Uh, the float only version, which is to say one that doesn't have doubles is eight kilobytes. But when you have to pull in 64 bit uh, float emulation, uh, you get, a, you get a, a almost 13 kilobytes of code. So you can see by just getting from double to float, I've saved four kilobytes of space, which is, in my world, that's a lot. Uh, so it's pretty valuable. It also runs faster, because now I'm only doing the computations on 32-bit instead of 64-bit values. OK, another adventure that I had. Um, uh, Newlib comes with kind of the oldest style of thread local storage I can ever possibly imagine. Uh, Newlib actually has a structure in the library that defines every single possible global state used anywhere in the library in a single structure in, with pointers and all kinds of magic and sticks it in this structure so that if you use any thread local variables in, in Newlib, you end up allocating one of these structures for every possible thread local variable in the entire library. So the structure can be huge. Uh, in particular, it has Saturday IO buffers in it. Yay! Um, it has things like um, big num values for uh, big num buffers for floating point to string conversion functions. It has, it has everything. It's an enormous structure. Um, I really didn't like that structure. Um, and it has it's, the worst attribute, of course, is that it doesn't have any real native support for um, defining how, to, how that structure is made thread local. Now, on, in, my old, in my old world of just using derpy little arm, uh, embedded processors, there was only one core. So you could use a global variable to point to the shared uh, global area, um, and when you switched threads, you would change the global variable. Uh, in my RISC-V world, I have a lot of deeply embedded processors that have multiple cores. Uh, so you can't use any in-memory state to reference the thread local state. The only way that I could do that is by using the RISC-V TLS support, which, you, which uh, dedicates a register in the processor, the thread pointer register, to reference this uh, thread local storage. So I could have used the new lib giant global data structure and pointed my thread local pointer at that, but now my application can't use any thread local storage because new lib, is, uh, new lib takes, takes it over, right? because I only get one of, I only have one pointer. So what I did instead is like, okay, I'm just starting from scratch. I'm gonna say, am I in the wrong, standing in the wrong place? Okay, okay, awesome. So instead what I did is I said, okay, I'm gonna actually use TLS storage and convert the entire library from using this global data structure to using TLS structures, uh, to using t TLS variables. Uh, the awesome part is on RISC-V, TLS support is fantastic. There's a dedicated uh, register name in the ISA. 
uh, called the thread pointer that points to your TLS uh, values. So when you fetch and when you load and store uh, TLS variables on risk five, you're using a register and an offset, uh, which is actually more efficient than using a global variable because the global variable has to have an address stored in memory that you fetch and then load again. Uh, so it turns out that TLS support is actually better than global variables on RISC-V. Uh, this is not true on some other architectures. Uh, some of them don't even have a, ver a register in the processor at all uh, to, uh, to store in a typical embedded environment. And so you're back to using a global variable, which is fetched through a function call. So every, on, the, on ARM, alas, every time you make a reference to a, global, a TLS variable, you make a function call to get the TLS pointer, which is fetched out of, out of memory, and then you uh, uh, use an index off of that. Okay, so I added a, a few APIs uh, to uh, the library so that an, uh, uh, an RTOS sitting on top of PicoLibc or using PicoLibc uh, could poke PicoLibc and, and allocate a TLS block for each thread that it allocated, uh, initialize it with the, uh, with the, stat with the constant data, um, and do all of that stuff. But the awesome part is, is that by or, uh, arranging the linker script uh, in, in a magic way, um, I could get the uh, zero data and initialized TLS data initialized automatically uh, by the application at startup time with zero overhead. I had to assign the thread pointer register to the correct value. Uh, so that was kind of a, a neat hack. Uh, the the, uh, the linker scripts do that for you. Uh, so if, you're, if you use PicoLibc and you enable threading, then you're going to need to go look at the uh, linker scripts that come with PicoLibc to figure out the magic uh, to get the thread local storage stuff initialized. Of course. TLS is optional. Uh, right now in the Debian build of the ARM compiler, embedded ARM compiler, TLS is disabled, so you don't have TLS in the ARM world, so you don't have that performance cost. <coughs> okay. Okay, the other thing I wanted to be able to do is I wanted to be able to build applications that I could run under QEMU or I could uh, build simple applications to run on an existing system. So I kind of wanted a complete library. I didn't want something that I had to build I had to build my own startup code. I had to write my own linker script. I had to do all of this work on my own just to get an application to run, which is what I experienced when I came to ARM 32-bit embedded development. So I wanted to provide the, the C runtime uh, to start up PicoLibc and a linker script. Now, of course, when you get into embedded, uh, embedded development, eventually whatever, the app, whatever I provide is not going to be sufficient. Uh, but at least it provides you a starting point of understanding what you need to do. Uh, and it may provide some, uh, some, useful, some useful hooks. Um, and it certainly provides for me an ability to run applications in PicoLibc under QEMU, which is really useful for testing. Uh, let's see. Okay, another really useful tool for uh, debugging in embedded environments is something called semi-hosting. Uh, how many of you have used semi-hosting in the ARM environment or other environments like that? Cool. Uh, so I'll explain what it is briefly, because uh, it's kind of cool. So when you're running under QEMU, you actually have a real operating system several layers down in the emulation stack. Uh, so it's kind of the easiest one to explain. So what semi-hosting does is it provides a way for the application running in the emulator to signal the emulator that, what, that it wants to do something in the operating system that the emulator is running on. Uh, similarly, if you're running an application on a host and are using GDB to that application over a link, uh, semi-hosting allows the application running on the actual target to signal GDB over the debugging link that it wants to talk to the operating system that GDB is running on. Uh, and one of the things that I really wish I had known that I could do uh, when I was developing uh, USB drivers was to be able to do debugging printf using semi-hosting out to GDB. Uh, because the way I typically ha ended up doing debugging of uh, USB drivers, because before I had USB running, I had no way to print anything for my application. Uh, so it would have been awesome if I had known about this uh, technique. So this is fantastic. Uh, so uh, the semi-hosting that ARM does is, is uh, also supported by RISC-V. Uh, so they have basically the same semi-hosting support. Uh, it does console and file I.O. Um, and it does one more amazing function when you're running on QEMU. You can call exit. So when you call exit in your, so I've got, I've got a board sitting right here, right? It's running some embedded application. What happens when I call exit on this board? What does it do? No. Typically exit is a no-op. It'll, it'll, it, it, it'll typically just return and your application keeps going. Uh, in the best of all possible cases, exit will spin forever. But it doesn't, it, 
it certainly doesn't tell you if that application got to exit or print an, ex an error, a status return, or anything useful like that. But it, in semi-hosting, what you can do is you can actually get the exit code, which is just a magic number passed to exit, all the way back out to your, to your, uh, to your hosted environment. And so you can detect if, uh, if your application running under emulation, what exit code it's, it's uh, provided. So, uh, so that actually turns out to be almost the most important part of semi-hosting. Can I get a number for my application, please? Uh, so the RISC-V QEMU patches um, are awaiting merge. I was, I was waiting for the 4.2 merge window. Uh, and now some other helpful QEMU developers have suggested that maybe I just start poking on a regular basis to see if they would get my patches merged. Um, they have been fantastic, uh, the QEMU developers. Uh, I actually uh, posted um, ones, uh, the first patch that I posted to do, uh, to do half of the changes. Uh, they completely rewrote so that they would actually work. <laughs> which was awesome. It's like, oh, I had this really crazy idea. This does what I need for me. And the QEMU developer's like, um, there are problems with your code. <laughs> you clearly don't understand how QEMU works. And it's like, you're right. <laughs> so, so if you ever, ever get a chance to interact with the QEMU developers, I highly recommend it. They were awesome people to play with. Uh, let's see, so the RISC-V QEMU patches are waiting. Obviously, they're in my GitHub and my uh, personal Git repositories. Uh, so if you want to play with this stuff, you can today. Uh, they'll probably be in QEMU 4.3. I, I don't know if it's 4.3 or 5.0. There's great. Yeah, OK. Apparently, the decision has been made. I'm not watching that closely. OK. So I'm developing a libc. A libc has a long history of standard conformance and things that it probably should do. Um, what's kind of a thing that you would expect a libc to have in it? Maybe a test suite so that you could make sure that your library actually did what it promised. Uh, LibC is actually a really, 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 really easy thing to test, right? It's got an API you call. It has a document that says what the API does. And it has a little specification that says, this is what the results should be if this function is working correctly. Uh, so unlike a lot of uh, places where I play uh, where testing is very difficult, LibC is this, almost the easiest thing to test that I've ever played with. Uh, it turns out that Newlib came with many, many, many tests. Uh, I, I think there's about 74,000 individual test cases or test vectors as, we call, as they call them in the testing world. Um, however, I'm reasonably sure they haven't been run in over 30 years. <laughs> um, there's, there's, as far as I can tell, no way to execute them in Newlib because Newlib provides no way to, pr to construct an application inside of Newlib that would actually run in any environment. It doesn't have any startup routines. It doesn't have any linker scripts. It doesn't have any QEMU support. It doesn't have any semi-hosting stuff. I don't know how you would run the tests uh, for QEMU. Uh, so all the test vectors look pretty good. Um, some of them had rotted. There'd obviously been some uh, automatic transformation of the tests that uh, caused them most to fail. Uh, so I fixed all of the tests because I could actually execute them. I actually have the CRT, the startup stuff. I have the semi-hosting stuff. I can build applications because I have a linker script. Uh, so all of the tests now pass on RISC-V. They all pass on ARM. And they all pass on x86 in both 32 and 64-bit mode. So the library runs on all of those targets. Uh, it doesn't actually do anything interesting on x86, of course, because it's not really its target environment. But it's really a useful development environment for checking code because it's uh, very easy to, de to debug. Uh, and you, uh, the compiling environment is much easier. Uh, the awesome part is um, the QEMU support for RISC-V lets you pick which architecture your processor supports, the emulated processor. Uh, RISC-V, if, uh, if you were in the early parts of the session, RISC-V has like eight different bits of possible support, whether it does integer embedded, uh, whether it has a multiply instruction, whether it has atomics, whether it does compressed instruction mode, whether it has floating point, whether it has double support, whether it has hypervisor, whether it has vectors, whether it has bit operations. The standard tool chain uh, that, uh, that is included in Debian right now has 30 different combinations of these, of these flags. Uh, and I really wanted to be able to test the PicoLibC compiled against all of these combinations because a real silicon uh, is, is very likely to be shipped in all these combinations. So I actually build uh, PicoLibC 30 different times. 
I compile the test 30 different times, and I run them under QEMU 30 different times with each of the target architectures. Uh, so I run 74,000 tests 30 times. Uh, I compile uh, the thousands of files in, in PicoLibc 30 different times, and I execute them all. Unfortunately, uh, the, ARM, uh, uh, the ARM QEMU support is not so generous. Uh, in fact, the only embedded ARM that I could figure out how to get to run was the Cortex-M3, uh, but I do run the tests under that. Uh, this, of course, does require uh, the semi-hosting support, uh, which is not yet upstream for RISC-V. Uh, so uh, that, will happen, that will happen soon. I'm obviously testing these locally on my own, with my own QEMU before I, before I release it. Here is actually a program that you can run uh, with the distributed Pico Libc. Um, this may be familiar to some of you. <laughs> yeah, so you can actually compile, execute, and run this. So if we had a little more time, I could show a demo, uh, but I was, I was spending too much time talking about, what? I got five minutes, awesome. Uh, so I wanna show you actually how to compile this program. Here's, here's the complete compile line. This is really long if, you've, if you're used to reading the KNR book where it literally says cc hello.c. Yeah, I know it's a lot longer than that, but trust me, this is amazing, the fact that you can express this pretty, con pretty concisely on a, on a single command line. Now we're gonna run the compiler, uh, RISC-564 Unknown Elf. GCC is the canonical name of the, uh, the cross-compiling compiler for uh, RISC-V processors. It's RISC-V 64 uh, because the default architecture that it compiles for is 64 bits. But this compiler actually supports all possible RISC-V targets, 32 and 64 bits. Don't be confused. Uh, I provide a GCC specs file that modifies the compiler behavior uh, to insert PicoLibc and all the other necessary flags, blah, blah, blah. Uh, again, if you need to do this manually, you'll have to dig up the file and dig out all the bits you need, uh, but it's certainly possible. Then I define the architecture of the target, which is, of course, the, the High Five, uh, Rev, high five um, uh, Rev B board, uh, which is an RB32 IMAC, 32-bit RISC-V with integers, multiply uh, atomics, and compressed instructions. The ABI is ILP32, which is to say integers, um, longs and pointers are all 32 bits. Uh, and then I'm gonna use this linker script, which I'll show you in the next slide, uh, that defines the addresses for the application. Um, I'm using this dash dash oslib equals semi-host, and that says that I have an operating system library that provides exit uh, put char and get char, um, and it's the semi-hosting one. Um, if you wanna do a different OS lib that provides these things, totally possible. Um, and the reason that it's a magic compile time thing is it has to be inserted on the compile line after libc. Normally, if you just put a library on this command line, it would be inserted before libc. So I've done this magic hack in the picolibc.specs that sticks this library, which is just libsemihost.a, it sticks it after libc. So that's why that's there. Um, and then you just give it the name of the, name of the program and it compiles it away. So in order to run on a particular target, you have to tell it where the memory of that target is. Um, and this is that linker script, that uh, hello world.ld. Uh, script that I was talking about. It tells it where the flash on the target is, uh, how much ra uh, where the RAM is located, and how much of each there are. And that's all you have to do. And then you tell it, oh, and go use the script from PicoLibc that does all the magic to get TLS to work and, and does all the other initialization stuff. Okay, so how big is this application? Well, the awesome part is when you compile that, it's really, really tiny. Did anybody know why this is smaller than my printf example before? Why is this only 894 bytes and the stupid printf example was two kilobytes? Why is that? Yes, exactly. The reason that this is smaller is because GCC says, oh, you called printf with a constant string. I can remove the new line from that and call the puts function. It's like, ah, oh, terrible. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> but it is, it is really, really small. Uh, if you did it with, uh, if you did it uh, uh, with without that optimization, of course, you would get about a two kilobyte executable. Uh, to run it, you can actually run this under QEMU, uh, and all you have to do is, you know, the usual. If any of you ever seen QEMU command lines, they all look like this. They're like forty-seven miles long with a million options. <laughs> yeah. And this defines all the things in order to construct a virtual machine that can run that executable, um, and it and it runs it just fine. Uh, so. What? Okay, so I can, I can actually uh, run that as a demo here pretty easily. So let me, uh, I'm just gonna do this. I think this is probably easier. Okay. 
So as you can see, I have hello world.c. Oops. And of course, I have a make file, because that's the kind of person I am. Uh, and this is going to compile all three versions, the integer version, the floating point version, and the, uh, and the full version. So if I just compile that, you can see those compile lines look the same as the ones that I showed you before. I think they should be the same. Oh, I'm uh, emitting map files. I was doing some debugging, so I, I had hacked up the make file recently. I'm trying to figure out why, I think, the, I think I had made some mistake somewhere in, in Pico Libcio. I was trying to figure out why I was pulling in some double precision code in the float version. It's a pretty common problem. You, you don't notice that except that the size explodes by another, another eight, eight, eight kilobytes or so. Okay, so now I can actually run this. And this has that, you know, a million options setting up for, for QEMU and it's gonna execute the uh, QEMU with all those options. Okay. <gasps> it prints out hello world! It actually... <laughs> And if you actually run this, uh, just the integer version, it actually says, oh, by the way, you passed me a floating point format character. I got no support for that. So it says star float star. So you can actually tell that it's different. So that is my talk about Pico Libsy. Thank you all very much for attending. I have a minute or two for, que for questions, you say? He was letting me have a couple of questions. The question here. So obviously you're aiming at tiny embedded systems. Mm -hmm. Can you build this on like a normal POSIX space so you could prototype on that and then before putting it on? Yes, and in yeah. fact, that's how I do most of the development for Pico Libc. Um, as I said, I have, so the awesome part is if you link with Pico Libc and compile against the Pico Libc headers, you can still also link against glibc and it's gonna hit all of the sys calls in glibc. So when I talked about that emulation layer that lets you call read, write, open, close, fseek, um, th those functions are available in glibc with the correct function signature. So you can compile your program against picolibc and glibc. It will use the sys call interface from glibc and use the rest of the library from picolibc. And so you can do all of the testing there. And that's in fact how I do I've done most of the conformance testing for this is in that environment before I got the semi-hosting working. Yeah, it's a very useful development environment. And that's something that Newlib, I, I discovered, I tried to do, tried to figure out how to get the testing stuff working in Newlib. And so I compiled Newlib as a native library and said, you know, don't do cross compilation for Newlib. And I typed make and it said dollar sign, the shell prompt. It literally did nothing. It's like, uh, we don't need a C library on your system. You already have one. <laughs> so I, couldn't, I can't do that with Newlib because the build system doesn't allow that particular case. Uh, one of the things I didn't talk about in Newlib is that actually, in PicoLibc is that it actually replaced the entire build system with Maison, which has been a fun adventure and something I should talk about some other day. Other questions? Uh, ben, did you have a question? Uh, so, is there is uh, this incestuous relationship between GCC and glibc that you're building GCC against when you want to do a proper full user space uh, yes. GCC? Yes. Uh, you completely avoiding that, or you also have that possibility? Um, so, um, when I build the cross compilers for ARM and RISC-V on Debian, I do not reference newlib. Glib, uh, GCC is built without reference to a C library there. The only reference you need to a C library when building GCC is for libstudded C++. That is the only reason you need a C library. Uh, my plan right now in order to support C++ in RISC-V embedded environments is to pull that library effectively out of GCC and compile it against each libc separately as, and package as a separate library. Because I do remember hitting some issue around TLS as well. Uh, no. There was some, at least on PowerPC, some issue about the stack protector constant being at a fixed offset from the TLS defined by the C library. That might be a PowerPC thing, fortunately, okay. because on RISC-V, ARM, and x86, the TLS stuff is not, not referenced to the stack at all. It's a separate pointer. No, no, not TLS itself. The stack protector constants. Oh, stack, stack protector? Yeah. At protector, a, uh, protector. Okay. <laughs> No, so I don't. I haven't seen any particular trouble with that. I've actually, I actually am not building. I'm actually, I actually have a glib, a GCC hack 
to disable the need for a libc when building gcc thank you for the talk very interesting um you mentioned developing uh, uh usb stacks um I think in, in, in something like this, if you're, if you're doing um, standard IO, IO against something uh, in an in a embedded environment, you probably then have some uh, SOC-specific driver for speaking to a UART, for example. Yep. Um, the USB case is not quite so simple. You, you have this whole protocol stack, mm -hmm. which at least some of it is perhaps hardware independent. Do you think something like that belongs in an RTOS or in a vendor-provided sort of hardware abstraction library, or is that something that really you should have in a standard library, if not, you know, you, albeit not a, a you know a C standard library? But that's that's a that's a good question. So I mean, it's it, embedded embedded system development has that perpetual issue: where do you put code, right? Um, in my environment, uh, typically. The USB stack, sometimes I let the USB stack be provided by the, the chip vendor. So in the ESP32 work that I've done, I'm using the USB stack provided by the vendor. Uh, for Atmega 32U4, uh, I wrote a USB stack because I needed one small enough. Um, and so I have that myself. And it provides the interfaces that PicoLibc requires. So that's in my application um, outside, outside of the uh, PicoLibc or the vendor provided environment. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously there's a lot of code that could be shared uh, and probably should be shared, uh, but one of, the, one of the challenges of embedded development is that the problem with sharing code, yep, uh, the problem with sharing code is that shared code is often larger code. Uh, shared code often provides more functionality than you need, uh, and so often, it, it's obviously a, a trade-off, uh, not related to PicoLibc, just kind of the overall embedded development environment, but yeah. Okay, I think with that, we're going to end it uh, and go on to our next speaker. Thank you very much for your time today. <laughs>